The New Level Cap Podcast is a show about fun, friends, game design, and all things otherwise. Your hosts are Marco DeSantos and Brad Talton of Level 99 Games. I'm Chris Solis, your producer, and without further ado, please enjoy the show. You find yourself upon a crested hill mountaintop, and you feel the gentle breeze in front of you, and you notice that it's much harder to walk forward when the breeze is against your wave of motion, but then you notice that spinning around makes it much easier to walk since the wind is behind you, and therefore you realize that the headwinds and the tailwinds of the world can make things easier or much harder. It is simply the direction in which you choose to walk that decides how easy or hard things have to be. So, punk, you can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way on the new Level Cap podcast where you can either shut up and sit down and listen to us talk about design and all things otherwise or you can decide to listen anyway. You had no choice. Free choice is an illusion and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Margo DeSantos, also known as the Mechanic Critic Elder God and with me is the old one of Level 99 Games himself. Wow, I'm an old one now. Marco, the intro started out pretty weird, but then it got really weird, and then it got a little, even weirder. I was overwhelmed by the uh, the desire to say, take crest throughout the entire thing. And like the crested hill, what it, or look crest. What is the crest? What crest is printed on this crested hill? The crest is the fire within it's your the, soul. the level 99 games crest. Yeah, it's, it's our logo. It's just a hill with our logo on it, actually. <laughs> I see. Okay, and we we stand atop the hill and uh, and give game design advice to those below. Yes, because we are obviously the best at this in our ivory crest hill, looking down upon the world uh, like the old ones that we are. Yes, did you say yeah. your name? Uh, oh yeah, I'm Brad. Brad Talton, D. Brad Talton Jr., President of Level Ninety Nine Games. You mean old one of Level Ninety Nine Games? And are you sure it's Brad Talton and not? <laughs> Uh, you know that that one didn't fit on my business card, so I uh, I opted for for the easier one. I see. And what can I say? Yeah. So so that's it, right? Like I guess as an old one, your name's pretty hard to spell, so that kind of limits your business opportunities. Despite your um, let's just say everlasting beyond belief power. Yeah, yeah. You know the uh, the whole Doom Colts. They're just not doing it anymore these days. You got to get into the fast track. You gotta gotta do business. You gotta do business. So, yeah. So I gotta I gotta push my product on the my old one product on a modern marketplace. I and see. So having a good business presence is important. Having a a human face to the company that is in fact the the ancient old one monstrosity is is really important to us. But you notice how that's kind of like a limiting factor, right? Like. By default, you're supposed to be winning, but because of certain constraints, it's harder for you to win, right? It's true. It's true. And I think that's a great topic for this week's episode. Really old one. Now, what would said topic be? So this week, we are going to be talking about headwinds and tailwinds, also known as comeback mechanics, you know, rubber band mechanics. These are forces in games which work to keep the players in a competitive lock right so your tailwind is when player like it pushes you faster a headwind slows you down uh, because it pushes against the direction you're moving and if you imagine all players in a race moving forwards towards the goal at the same time if your players at the front have a headwind they'll be pushed back to the pack if your players in the back have a tailwind they'll be pushed forward into the pack players will stay close to the center of that racetrack or at least close to each other which keeps the race dynamic and interesting for all parties involved. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about these sort of mechanics. Um, I don't want to just say comeback mechanics because sometimes they are really, they, because they can work from both directions. We're not just pulling people up from behind. Sometimes we're also pushing people back from ahead. The entire point that they exist isn't to balance the game necessarily competitively you know what i mean it's like yeah. pe people often get the misconception that these kinds of mechanics are implemented in such a way that makes the game more fair and that's not true <laughs> it makes the game more entertaining and engaging which is what games yeah. are supposed to be or at least that's the experience yeah. that people and, are meant to be provided 
and there's a certain context to, to fairness, as we say, right? Like these are the rules and the context in which we agree to play. And, you know, if all players are aware of all the rules, they know that when they get so far ahead that there might be a penalty, or if they get so far behind, there might be a mechanic that helps them catch up. As long as players understand this and um, and are you know are working within the constraints, as long as they agree to play the game, then that's not really a problem. I guess it's all about again hearkening back to episode one where we talk about the purpose and design. If the purpose of the game does not line up with the purpose of the player, then it it won't ever work, right? Like yeah, yeah, that's that's true. And so I guess that's a good place for us to to start the discussion, right? Like why would you why care why bring the last place players forwards they if they don't if they haven't earned that position why hold the first place players back when they really are that much better and deserve the position yeah why would you do this well so i think i think we kind of blur the lines when we start talking about this let's be very clear right tailwinds and headwinds aren't a mechanic or a feedback system because you know it could also be called positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops essentially right but Mm -hmm. These kinds of mechanics and these kinds of implementations and systems aren't for every game, right? Because it really depends on the experience that people want to get in. If you are a competitive skill-based player and you want the game to be an expression of your skill and to celebrate your skill, any form of headwind and tailwind will just feel cheap and unfair to you, right? Because in the end, I hey, wait, I'm the better player... Why did they win? What we really want, right, is we want everybody to be involved the whole time. Once you're playing a game of, let's say, like like Mario Kart, and you get lapped, it's not really that interesting anymore, right? You you've already lost. Yeah. And so, um, or once you're playing a game of, I don't know, let's say like uh, like basketball, and you get you know seventy, eighty points behind, well, you pretty much already lost. So, but the game has to go, you know, all the way to the fourth quarter because that's the format. Right, and so these mechanics are really an attempt to reconcile the format with the actual contest that's happening inside that format. I see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's reel it back into the main point, right? Which is mm-hmm. that ultimately it's to keep the game engaging, right? Right. It's like to keep the game engaging for the players, because when you win and you still when you've already won and you just have to finish the rote task of like doing your next lap. So that you can so you can end the race, that's not fun for anybody. And when you're way behind and you're just waiting for the first place player to finish their next lap so that they can end the race, that's not fun either. Yeah, I mean, right? it's very prevalent in a lot of strategy games where one player takes an early lead and everybody just knows that it's done, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's not engaging at all. Because instead of having fun while playing the game, now the game is this tedious task that you just have to finish. Yeah, you just have to finish what's already been decided. And so there's two there's two things you can do. One is you can just terminate the game early. If a player generates this much of a lead, they just win outright. The other option, and often that's not an option because if there's if the game's not zero sum, if there's multiple players, one player might get very far ahead of another player, but ne- not necessarily too far ahead of the pack which we, is kind of the general term for all of the other players who are just kind of in the middle. Yep. Right? You'll generally see one group of players be like in the top, you know, like the top three, another group of players be down in the bottom three that are, that are lagging behind, and then the other 14 or so will kind of be in the pack. So the, the alternative to just ending the race early when somebody gets such, so much of a lead is to try and come up with artificial controls to keep the players closer to the middle. So that the same losers don't always lose, and so the same winners don't always win. You can increase competitiveness, and for those players who are way ahead, they can still feel threatened, still have kind of the rush of competition, even though their skill is on a higher level than the other players. Yeah. So, so those are so that's and that second option is what we want to talk about is the the controls you use to pull everybody towards the center. And so, if you're not just playing to win. If you're playing to have a good experience with the other players in the game, these mechanics really do improve the experience of the gameplay. So, Brad, let's talk about a few examples uh, of these kinds of mechanics uh, that we've seen in games or that we've implemented in our own games. I'll start with the very infamous example that everybody always quotes when they talk about this in design, and that's the blue shell in Mario Kart. Or actually, just 
item distribution and Mario Kart in general. So for the people who don't know <laughs> and are listening to this podcast for some reason, uh, the further ahead you are in Mario Kart, the worse items you get. And the further behind you are in Mario Kart, the better items you get. When you get to the end, you're almost always going to roll golden mushrooms, lightning bolts, blue shells, the crazy high tier items. And when you get to the front, you might get a mushroom or a green shell. And stuff is not super useful. Yes. So uh, this is epitomized by the blue shell, right? Because the blue shell as an item literally only messes with the first place player. Because that's what the blue shell does. You throw it, regardless of whatever place you are, and it will home in the first player and instantly like mess with them. And only yeah. And but it, it it is it is dodgeable. So there is tech for blue shells. You can you can hold a mushroom. You can boost out of it. Yeah. You know if you if you can jump just right, you can minimize a lot of the effects. See, but ultimately um, that's what makes this quite good, right? The blue shell only really interacts with the, yeah. the skillful player who supposedly has the skill to even dodge it in the first place, right? Right, and it, so it's really it it increases the difficulty for a first player, which is good. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't artificially hold them back. And you say Mario Kart is infamous, but I think Mario Kart is a really good example of how to do it right. Because I tell you about an example of how to do it wrong. Uh, very few people played but is kind of a classic uh, Kirby's Air Ride. Kirby's Air Ride? Okay. In Kir- Kirby's Air Ride was a racing game. And in Kirby's Air Ride, when you are ahead, your speed limit actually goes down. And when you are behind, your speed limit actually goes up and your acceleration increases. So they so just literally rubber band and handicap they, you. Yeah, they literally just like truly you know, push you faster from the back and pull you and, and push away, push against you from the front until you're back in the pack. And it feels really bad and it's, uh, and it's not good uh, because it felt so artificial. Players were like, I'm doing really good, so I'm just getting punished. Whereas with Mario Kart, a player's doing really good and so the difficulty increases. Well, I yeah. think Smash Bros. has a good part of this too. Like when you are behind in Smash, for example, um, you get uh, I rage. think the effect is rage, and so when you're when you're low on life, your character hits a little bit harder. And when you're so the players that are doing really well are going to take more damage from the players that are not doing really well. Yeah. So that doesn't increase that doesn't punish explicitly the players doing well, and it doesn't buff the players doing badly. It makes the difficulty higher for the players doing well, and it makes the difficulty lower for the player who's doing poorly. But it doesn't doesn't feel bad because the players are are you know are able to mitigate it through superior skill. The game just asks you to output more and more and more of that superior skill as you get further and further ahead. These kinds of mechanics are great when you're trying to balance or like quote unquote normalize and keep competitive games where there is one clear skillful player and an unskillful player. Yeah, and it'll really they really truly only work. Well, with a pack as well. Yeah. Like if you just have one on one, and that's one of the things I think Smash Brothers is so brilliant with is when you get to a heads up situation where there's only two players left in the game, rage shuts off. Are uh, you... At least that's how I understand it. No, uh, from what I've read. Really? Because as far as I know, rage still applies even in one on one. We we might have to to do the research, but I I think that's the I think that's the way it works. Someone okay. will have to check and, and post in the comments for us. Yeah, smash smash experts. As far as I know, it still applies regardless of whether it's one on one or not. But yeah, I mean, here see so here are some other examples just for the listeners to understand better. Just in case you know these examples that we given aren't enough. Uh, how about from our games, Brad? Yeah, I'll go so... with BattleCon. Is that okay? Because I have I have to talk about BattleCon once every episode. If I don't, yeah. my soul gets crushed. Okay, it's like the Dark Souls of level ninety nine games. Oh my gosh, you said it. Why did? And then you, you always it? have to say it every episode. Uh, <laughs> okay, so in BattleCon, there's a mechanic called the Force Gauge, and there are things called Overdrive finishers, which are these huge power attacks that aren't necessarily always good but often allow the character to perform an option that they didn't have before that usually deals either a lot of damage or gives them a game-breaking effect should it resolve right 
And when the player gets low enough on life, that's only when they can access the overdrive finisher. This means that players who got low, aka the players who are losing, now gain access to this very powerful option. It, it's kind of like the Mario Kart thing, right? It's giving the losing player an extra powerful option, but not literally just saying, oh yeah, the leading player now loses 10 life, so you have the same amount of life. You know what I mean? It's not an yeah. artificial thing. It still and takes... Having those, having those extra force resources to use the overloads also makes you a little more threatening to your opponent just in a general sense. Yeah, because you can anti-priority uh, every turn and not lose out on priority and your opponent at some point will run out because you gain yeah. double the amount of force so that it, they it do. It asks them to... Until, um, or or to be or to be pulled back into the pack. But to contrast that, um, we have Exceed, which is is our other fighting game. And and in Exceed, you don't have that, right? You almost seem to have a um, a tailwind for the winner because when you hit, you get Gauge, and Gauge is a resource you can spend. But it's a little more insidious because it works on a turn by turn basis. When I attack and I press my advantage, even if I do a bunch of damage and hit you, I'm starting to lose my card advantage. Whereas the player on defense. They can play wild swings. They can sometimes just randomly get out of an attack if they're lucky, but they certainly will not lose their resources. Whereas the attacker who's pressing the attack will gradually run out of tempo and be forced to take a breather, draw more cards, or even turn their gauge back into a new hand through the change card system. So the the game will naturally equalize uh, as tempos change, through, or as as you know as your hand sizes change. Yeah, I mean ultimately. I feel like the exceed mechanic, like before we started talking about this, I actually didn't even think of that possibility in this topic, right? Because it's kind of ingrained into me that that's just how card games work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's very, it feels very intuitive. Um, but the, one of the things about exceed is that it gives you cards so easily, all you have to do is stop and take them. So it does it does really change the um, dynamic uh, that that back that dynamic, yeah. Yeah, speaking of dynamics, let's talk about implementation. So we have, uh, we've mm-hmm. listed down two ways that you could probably implement or like talk about these kinds of mechanics. So we well, have... when I say, I mean, we say implementation, but I mean, like, what, what, how do you do this right? Right? Like, like, that's not just how do you do it, but how do you, because it's pretty, e- it's not going to, there's no re- right answer for any game. Of right? course. In Mario Kart, blue shells work, but like in Kirby's Air Band, just rubber banding doesn't work. Like, there's no kind of one-size-fits-all solution, but there's a right way to do these mechanics. Yeah, so dynamism is essentially rubber banding, right? So the, yeah. the further ahead you are, the the harder you're pushed back, and the, harder behind, the further behind you are, the harder you're pushed forward. First place might get a significant, quote-unquote, disadvantage, but fifth place might not get the same amount of disadvantage. Yeah. And it really depends how far ahead you are from the pack and how far behind you are from the pack. So you're looking at kind of the average of all your players. And you want to try and pull players towards the mean by either making them spend more to get further ahead or making the returns, you know, making the returns on getting further and further ahead neg- uh, lower and lower, uh, but never negative. Um, and the same thing, you want to make the, you know, the benefits of getting behind stronger and stronger, but you never want to make them so positive that getting behind is a strategy for getting ahead. Yes. I mean, unless, unless you know, you have... Uh, unless that's a mechanic of the game. And that could be a cool mechanic for a game, but... But it also... It often feels counterintuitive when things are like that, right? And people often find that to be weird. Like, I, I've been playing Dota Auto Chess. Have, have you been mm-hmm. playing Auto Chess? Anyway, the, the Dota Auto Chess has a tailwind and headwind <laughs> mechanic where a person continuously winning gets a win streak but a person continuously losing gets a lose streak. So there is now a, a quote-unquote pro strat because it's easier to lose than it is to win. A new strategy comes up wherein you try to lose, but by the smallest margin possible so that you continuously gain as much gold as whoever's winning. So, <laughs> so, so it's it's really weird, right? Like, like you purposely lose so that you can win? You, you know, it feels counterintuitive to do so. But hey, that's the deal. So I, I think it's also very important to stay focused, right? Um, when yeah. we when we do these kinds of mechanics, it's very important to understand that it can feel bad, right? Like like in the Kirby Kirby what Kirby what Kirby's Air Ride. Yeah. yeah. So like in Kirby's Air Ride, it, it it feels bad. So oftentimes you want to understand how this can affect uh, the the experience of the player, and oftentimes it's this. You oftentimes want to do this in such a way that you help the lagging behind players. Rather than 
impede the winning players because oftentimes yeah. it's better to bring someone up than bring someone down in terms of experience right yeah because nobody nobody cares if you get you know 11th place instead of 15th place due to random chance but somebody's going to care if you get first place in or sorry third place instead of first place by random chance yeah and it always feels bad to be pulled back when you're doing well um yeah. increasing difficulty is a good way to do it but it's it's also nice to just you know focus forward where the player who's ahead pulls everyone forward towards them as opposed to the players in the middle pulling both the front and the back players towards them because you know to go with our race again as kind of the key analogy to this if you pull people towards the middle it makes the game take longer to terminate which is kind of the problem we were actually trying to solve. So we need to be pushing the game towards a conclusion in which they win, while also giving other players a chance to maybe upset that. You want players to feel like they they can take advantage of more, or that they have to play better and better and better, you know, as opposed to uh, to just artificially yanking them around. So make it feel natural, and make it so that um, there's always a way to win, and there's always a way to lose. Uh, yeah, as any game should. So as much as I'd like to keep talking, we should probably head on over to a break and snap someone's neck. Why, why so violent today? It's time for Collusion. Millennium Blade's Collusion is coming to Kickstarter this February. It features a new co-op mode and a storage solution for all things Millennium Blades. Check out the description for a preview link to the project. Marco, ah. I'm already half Xehanort. No. I'm so far ahead of you that you get to become a quarter Xehanort for free. Oh, Brad. But no, that's a bad thing, right? I don't want to be full Xehanort ever. Hey, this combat... Hey, these these tailwinds and high headwinds are bad. I don't like any of it. Shouldn't it be that the more Xehanort you become, there should be mechanics that make you less Xehanort? I think that's. I think this is all the uh, the question of what it means to truly win. Uh, Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Is it becoming fully norted or becoming fully cleansed by the holy light that's within you? I mean, you didn't actually understand this, but during the break, uh, Marco died and was replaced by a digital double controlled by Xehanort. And this is actually real Marco talking through that puppet because the power of your love and friendship uh, got through to me from the other realm. And now, look, Marco. Uh, I'm gonna need. I'm just gonna need uh, like a breakdown video of the complete Marco canon because I can't follow all this. Uh, all this recap. Okay, sure, sure. So in case, so here's a quick reference chart. Just, There's yeah, real just, Marco. Just, send, just link me to the Marco timeline after. after I see. Podcast. Is yeah. Over. Okay. That's that's fair. Just oh, by the way, just saying, Edge Marco's my nobody. Don't tell anyone. Brad, let's get back on topic and let's talk more about the advantages and disadvantages of using headwinds and tailwinds in your game and whether or not. Because ultimately, at the start, we were talking about how they should make the experience better. But they could also make the experience worse. So I think we talked a lot about what makes the experience better, right? So we have essentially making the game more engaging, making the game more, quote-unquote, fun for everyone, making the game so More that, casual, better yeah. for TV, those kinds of things. Yeah. Be- better for TV. <laughs> I mean, seriously, better for TV. Like, I mean, a lot of games will, will you know, will have rules in place that will... You know, that just make them better for viewing. And this is one of those things that you put you could put in a game to make it more interesting to the players who are on the outside looking in. And that's a concern for a lot of games, right? That's true. You know, this was often something I failed to reconcile, but now that you're saying it in this way, I think I understand more because when let's get out of board gaming and video gaming, let's talk about actual games, like sports, right? I often feel weird whenever people who like sports complain about a team who has more than one superstar in it, that always Mm -hmm. felt weird to me. Because I'm like, wait, I don't understand. Isn't the point of the basketball game to win? And you're getting mad at a team for getting players that allow them to win? And I think now that you're saying this, it's it's about whether it's entertaining for people to it, watch. Yeah, it does it like when when a team that's like an all star team meets up with a team that's you know that's not the the conclusion is foregone, and it's it just doesn't make it doesn't make for an interesting game to watch either side just get thrashed for an hour. Yeah. So so these kind of mechanics and and when you talk about like leagues like that, the you know your your NBA draft is a kind of balancing mechanism. Where the players who are who are behind get earlier drafts, which means they get the first pick at the better candidates. Ah, 
which helps to normalize the league over time and keep everyone competitive. I like that. I like that. So so it keeps everything engaging. Ultimately, that's it, right? Like, that's the main point of these comeback mechanics. Or the headwinds and the tailwinds, or negative feedback, positive feedback loops. Whatever you want to call them, that's their point, right? They keep things entertaining. They keep things fun. They keep things, uh, you know, close so that players don't yeah. feel disengaged. Yeah, and it, 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 it may be, what you say, like a little more casual, but... Truly, that's that's kind of the point, right? Like, if we're not if we're not in it to measure skill, we're in it to have fun, and people have more fun when the competition is is actively threatening, even if we're not all competing on the same level. I want to be threatened by the opponents that are in the game against me. I want to feel like I could win or lose at any given moment, and when you don't feel that, the game is is over. You just are doing a chore. Yeah, I, I feel that whenever I play Civ against AI, or when when you play a MOBA, oh gosh, oh goodness. Like yeah, when, when like you, MOBA against AI, it's just, you know, it's just rote. It's just rote. I think ultimately, like we, we've, we've explained multiple times, that's essentially it, right? These kinds of mechanics are to keep things engaging, especially for games that tend to last long, even after the winner has been decided. So we, we've gone at that ad nauseum, and I think it's more useful for us to talk about the negatives, because we didn't really broach a lot of them uh, when we were talking. Because yeah. as much as we would like to say that these things are very good, uh, they can also be very bad. So Brad, how can poorly implemented or uh, headwinds and tailwinds implemented in the wrong kind of game negatively impact your experience. Like we've we've said a little bit earlier, if a game is truly meant to be a measure of skill, then any kind of artificial headwind or tailwind is going to feel bad for both players involved. You want the game to truly measure who is the better competitor, and not to uh, and not to artificially try and fix the match, right? Yeah. And um, these can be things that that feel cheap, like we're talking about, like um, rage and smash. I was I was thinking actually more of like the uh, the final smashes in Smash, right? Like sometimes you just get a final smash and you just put everybody on the screen to sleep, and there's nothing that anybody can do about that. I guess that's true, yeah. So, so it's so it's it's kind of a fine balance, right? About whether you want it to to be truly competitive, or we say like maybe your X factor in the Marvel vs. Capcom games, where a player who's behind can you know can uh, use all their gauge and get super strong to to have a more fighting chance. And granted, in most of these games, like all players have equal access to this, but if a player who is losing harder has a chance to slingshot past. Like, say, we're both kind of doing kind of medium, but you're doing a bit better, and so I get my X-Factor, and I use it to just one-shot and wipe you out in a combo, and so you don't get that same advantage that I got, that can feel a bit cheap, right? Yeah. Like, I could actually lose to win in, in a game like that. I think the this is one thing that's very important that we should point out. And I think that X-Factor, for example, and maybe Rage to a degree, and maybe Final Smashes to a degree as well, is an example of how I feel like these kinds of things can be poorly implemented because it doesn't take into account the dynamism, right? We were talking about how dynamism is very important in determining these kinds of mechanics. Somebody who's super mega ahead should get super mega put back, but somebody who's slightly ahead shouldn't get super mega put back either. And yeah, it becomes a problem when both players or all the players are of similar ish skill levels right yeah and it can happen when you have like a flat a flat bonus that just you hit this point flat bonus is dispensed to you exactly and, that's um, that's ex, and, that's x factor right that's literally yeah. what x factor is yeah and that can be that can be pretty dangerous to to give out to players we had that situation in battlecon as well with uh berman so laramore berman had a, a finisher attack that was pretty much an auto kill and one of the like main berman strategies is just to uh to take hits and build power until you're in finisher range and then try and one-shot your opponent. That's an interesting play style, but it doesn't feel great when your opponent discovers it mid-match, right? So um, so you kind of have to go into it knowing what, what your opponent's capable of. It's been fixed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been fixed. It's no longer like that. But yes, it's it. that's that's the problem, right? When Or like in Dota Auto Chess, when I was just talking about it. When, mm-hmm. when, when the, players can just try to just lose yeah. to win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it because is the li- payout structure is skewed towards loss instead of win. I mean, or is equal to win. You know what I mean? Right? Like, if yeah. the payoff structure is the same for winning as it is for losing, 
people have an incentive to go with with, the, with whichever one is easier to do. And it's way easier to lose than to win. It's kind of weird how these mechanics can kind of force, quote-unquote, the players to play the game in a way that no longer feels like the game. Yeah, it becomes a different game. That becomes another big negative, I think, that I don't think we've necessarily broached upon. And it's that these things, if the players playing them are really that competitive, rather than just feel bad about it, they'll do the Magic the Gathering thing. And instead of feel bad that it works this way... We're like, how can we exploit this to make it worse for everyone else? And then the game <laughs> becomes a shadow of its former self, right? That's but we should we should talk about yeah, we should talk about payouts at some point and how payouts can affect the way a game is played and the way that players value winning the game and how they try to win the game. Um because that's a really interesting topic and it's it's a, kind of a core part of game theory. Yeah. Um, so it- so it'd be a great it'd be a great topic for a future episode. If you're interested in that topic, please tell us in the comment section down below. We'd be very glad to talk about it. Brad, here's a very important point that I have to talk to you about. All right. Let's, let's go back go to ahead. episode one, where we talked about expectations in design uh, and purpose in design. And ultimately, it harkens back to our earlier point in that it really depends on whether or not you're going into the game expecting a certain kind of experience. Yeah. And it also depends, especially for you as the designer, if are you more in, interested in in creating experience or in measuring skill? Yeah. Right. And that's that's sort of the dividing line that I see in this in this sort of mechanic is: Am I going to make a true hardcore competitive experience where players win or lose by their own ability, or am I going to make a casual experience for players to kind of get into the game, have fun? play competitively but not too cutthroat so that everybody has a, a real chance if not an not an equal chance but a real chance of winning and one thing i'd say too is that there are there are other parts of this right like you can just you can always just short circuit a game once a player gets so far ahead and that's not wrong there are a lot of games that if you reach a certain a certain amount of lead you win and the simplest example would be like street fighter right like or any kind of match based game if you get two of your three wins before the third one, then the game ends prematurely, right? And the player with two wins wins. You go 2-0. and oh. And that's true in all match games, because it just makes sense. And if you think that you don't want to have these kind of comeback mechanics in your game, that you should look for a way to make the game short circuit when a player is doing so much better than other players. That's true. Um, some board games also implement this in a way that, now that we're talking about it in this context... I actually realized that a lot of Euro, no, not Euro, sorry, a lot of games implement this mechanic wherein if said, if one player reaches X amount of points, end game starts. And then I realized that that's basically an early termination mechanic because they hinge the end game on whether or not somebody has reached a certain amount of points. So that means the end game can start really late if everybody doesn't know what they're doing. Or if one person knows exactly what they're doing, it could start super early. Yeah. A great example of this is Dominion, where it'll end if any three types of cards are empty, or if the main scoring card is consumed. So if there's no more of the main scoring card, you end the game immediately. And that is kind of a way that Dominion is saying, like, like hey, if anybody pulls ahead of the pack, or if all the players have reached, like, in-game level early, then let's end the game and get it over with. Yeah. I think that's... Super interesting. Right. You don't always have to make use of these kinds of mechanics to solve the problem. There's, there isn't one solution to the problem of a decided game or a solved yeah. game, right? Yeah, it depends on what your goal is, the solution that you choose to use when you're engineering your game. So would you say that early termination kind of leans towards games that measure skill? while headwinds and tailwinds lean towards games that are meant to provide a fun experience. Um, I would say that it it depends. It's it's a little bit of that. It also depends on the game length. If a game is short, then it's better off just declaring a winner and scooping than trying to pull the lower place player back into the pack. Especially with games that are 1v1 or zero sum, pulling the players back together is dangerous, like we saw with X Factor. Mm-hmm. And it's better to just terminate the game early if one player is is showing a, a, a really strong lead. But it but conversely, if the game is, is really long, maybe you do want to pull the players together. If you're doing something like Civilization, right, where the game might take take hours or days, 
than having comebacks like technologies that have been discovered by other people are cheaper or um you know like re- uh research trading is a great comeback mechanic you know stuff like that cuz like with research trading is a great one in Civ um and I wanted to mention earlier cuz when you do a research trade with somebody the more technologically advanced player gets a worse tech that they skipped and the more technologically behind player gets an advanced tech that you know that would have taken them a lot longer to research yeah yeah that's true but th- that's why ultimately in competitive civ games people don't even agree to anything right well you you do it with the npcs yeah but yeah. but i don't know in if in in multiplayer they will but that's that's an aside that uh, that kind of got sidetracked yeah, yeah, yeah anyway it depends a lot on the nature of the game and a lot on your objectives as a designer and the experience that you try to create but that's why planning ahead is is an important part of designing a game figuring out the true experience you want to create for the players right. first before and then what get... mechanics are going to generate the experience. Yes, yes. Ultimately, that's that's the point we want to say, right? Begin with the end in mind. Don't just go like, mm-hmm. oh, here's this cool mechanic. I want to make a game around it. No, stop. Don't do it, right? Like, you can do that, but you have to understand that the point is that you're meant to provide an experience or do something with the mechanic. The game doesn't exist just to house your mechanic. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. yeah. A mechanic is not a game. Mechanic is not a game. So listen to me, Brad. As much as I'd like to keep talking, we have to terminate this podcast. Oh, well, we'll be back next week. As usual, it has been me, your host, Marco DeSantos, also known as the Mechanic Critic. And as much as I'd like to tell you to enjoy everything, remember, give us a comment, give us a like, subscribe, share it with a friend, or share it with a frenemy that you want to hate. And with me has been my amazing... I'm not sure I support all these endorsements. Are you sure? But thank you for listening to the podcast. It's been our pleasure to chat with you. Who are you? uh, we look forward to chatting with you next time. Wait, who are you? What do you mean, who am I? Oh, I'm I'm Brad. I'm Brad. I'm Brad, your co-host. Yes. Brad Talton. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, World of Indians. Thank you, and good night. Good night. Happy designing. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. The new Level Cap podcast is produced by Level 99 Games. Join us next Wednesday for more design talk and shenanigans. This has been Chris Solis, and thank you for listening.